everyone. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you all? Good morning, sir. Good morning, Good morning, sir. Good morning. We are all doing well, sir. We thank God for meeting here once again, for thank coming you. together as a family once again. We thank, thank God you, for, yes, for another week, uh, for another lecture, for the health of everyone. We thank God for that. So we want to continue from where we left last week. I think last week I was talking about flea volume excess. I hope you got it. So uh, I explained uh, what is flea volume excess. Uh, I explained what is flea volume excess. And I talked about incidence of flea volume excess, what causes flea volume excess, and we discussed the causes into details. I went further to talk about I went further to talk about the rule of the ANP, the atra natural peptide in managing uh, flea volume excess as a compensatory mechanism, as a positive feedback and negative feedback mechanism to control fluid balance as a hemolysis mechanism and renal failure, the rule of the kidney in flea volume excess. And we talked about the rule of the kidney as the tap that opens to excrete excess fluids and the waste and also balance electrolytes. And therefore, when it fails, the work of the kidney in balancing fluid and electrolyte is greatly affected. And therefore, you have flea volume excess. I talked about the role of the liver the liver producing the plasma proteins. The oncotic pressure is maintained in a normal plasma protein, and that maintains the osmotic pressure of the blood. And therefore, in a diseased liver, like cirrhosis of the liver, these plasma proteins are not produced and therefore affect the composition and the constituents of the plasma proteins in the blood. And this reduces the plasma proteins and therefore reducing the osmotic pressure of the blood compared to the tissue fluid, which will have a higher osmotic concentration. And therefore, by the process of osmosis, fluids are going to move from the blood or intravascular into the interstitial space, creating excess fluid, causing edema, and so on and so forth. And I said, as fluid move the intravascular space, definitely there will be a stimulation of the adrenal cortex to uh, retain more aldosterone or release aldosterone to retain sodium. And once sodium is retained, fluids are also retained to replenish the depleted fluid from the intravascular volume into the interstitial space. So as they move from the intravascular into the interstitial space, the role of the adrenal cortex releasing aldosterone, retaining sodium and water is also replaced or replaced fluids into the intravascular. So there's a cyclical movement of fluids until the interstitial space become excessively edematous, such that they can no more contain fluids, which becomes incompatible with life. And therefore, you see the arterial pressure becomes so great and so high. And I showed you the picture last week that the arterial pressure or arterial hydrostatic pressure pushing against the interstitial pressure with a net force. And these fluids will keep on driving and it will accumul be accumulated in the uh, left ventricles of the heart. And once the left ventricle becomes too congested with fluids, definitely it will affect the congestion and the congestion will be affecting the right side causing congestive heart failure. So we talked about how the body becomes extremely edematous. Then we talk about excessive ingestion of table salt. Some people, once you give them food, they will take salt, it will add salt. And once you increase the salt intake, you increase in sodium and sodium will definitely retain fluids. And that will expand the blood volume and put pressure on the body, causing fluid volume excess. Okay. So we talked about the rule of the people who take 
uh, a lot of uh, 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 minerals, the mineral corticoids and then the glucocorticoids, especially the women who have delivered and is trying to put on weight. They take in these minerals and these blood tonic and they add paratin and they eat too much and they the, the minerals make them absorb sodium and water and expand their, their body. So they become heavy and they put on weight as a result of eating and building too much carbohydrate. So this is the Cushing syndrome wow. using glucocorticoids as a risk factor. Okay. And then we have the other infusions where you are using the uh, irrigation after the transuterine resection and you don't want the blood to clot within the urethra system, you flush. And once you are using hypotonic solution to flush, the body absorbs some of these uh, or fluids move into the body and this can increase the total body water. We talk about the pathophysiology uh, of this. And that was where I, I explained that the arterial pressure or arterial hydrostatic pressure always pushed in there. And once the arterial pressure is pushed, you, you have, um, let me, I think uh, I have another picture here. Let me try and show those pictures to you. Um, Okay, so um, okay, so I used the diagram here to explain to you about the fluid volume excess when there is increased hydrostatic pressure at the arterial end of the capillary with a total pressure of 41.3 millimeters of mercury. And this pressure is forced inside the tissues as against the tissue pressure or hydrostatic pressure of um, 28 millimeters of mercury. So here there is existing pressure and the fluid hydrostatic pressure from the arterial end is having that 41.3. So there will be a net force of pressure that will push fluids into the cells. So there will be a net force of 41.3 minus 28. If you don't tell that lady to mute the mic, I will take her off. I'm trying to mute all, but she keeps on releasing the microphone. I will take her out if she keeps on doing that. So you subtract 28 from 41.3 and the net is 13.3. So it is the net force, hydrostatic force, that will push fluid into the cells. So if you come to the venous end, this explains the pathophysiology of fluid volume excess, how the body can retain a lot of fluids. So if you come to the venous end here, you have the, uh, the, the, the inward. Already the inward osmotic pressure is 28 as it is in the cells. And you are having a very low venous pressure, which is 21.3. Unlike the arterial pressure where it was 41.3, the venous end has a lower pressure at a certain pressure of 21.3 millimeters of mercury. And this is subtracted from 28. So you see that the venous end of the uh, uh, blood vessels will have a greater force than the 
uh, hydrostatic pressure that is uh, coming here at the venous end. So the venous end has a very low pressure. So unlike the pressure that pushed fluid into the cells, here the fluid will rather have to move from the cell because the inward pressure is higher than the pressure at the venous end. If you subtract, you have 6.7, pushing fluid from the cells into the venous blood, and therefore the waste and other fluids move out of the venous cell. That is how waste and excess fluid, including venous blood, move out of the cells and join the venous blood and move back to the heart for exchange of gases. So that is how the fluid move out in and out of the cell using fluid hydrostatic pressure and then on quantity pressure of the blood. All right, so once it goes to the heart, the congestion is created as a backward pressure from the left side, later the heart is affected. Okay, so um, that was it. So all these are overview of what we did last week. I'm just giving an overview of what went on last week before I started or before I start today's lecture. Okay, so... Uh, Okay, so today's lecture, uh, I'm starting from detecting because we managed, we managed people with fluid volume excess and we use the nurse's process or the nursing process approach. We said we start with assessments and once you do assessment, you will know what to do. The daily weight taking, the uh, uh, risk of taking uh, uh, other input and output as a measure to detect the fluid balance in the person will inform the whole thing. The degree of pitting edema, once the person pits, you know what to do, that there's too much fluids. And congestive heart failure, you need to manage the person as fluid overload by uh, the use of ambulatory aid, like walkers, and you don't allow the person to exert uh, any strenuous uh, 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 strength to cause breathlessness. So how to manage them, the plan and the goals, the diagnosis, the nursing diagnosis were given. And these are all what we did last week. So here we want to look at detecting and control of the volume excess. So the intervention includes, once you have diagnosed them, they provide them rest. So, uh, complete bed rest is very important because these patients cannot have a clear lungs to go, uh, give you the exchange of gases because the fluids have been accumulated and they are experiencing pulmonary edema, there is the need to make sure that you rest them because gases are poorly exchanged and therefore they don't have that energy. So you need to provide them with rest. Sodium restriction because of the excessive retention of sodium and expansion of the ECF, you see restrict sodium. So you don't have extra retention of fluids in the body. Close monitoring of parental fluid therapy. So here you use the input or intake and output to measure how much is the patient losing. This is what the patient takes. So you know the retention amount of fluids. So administration of appropriate medications, the lasers if the kidneys are working. If you administer lasers, definitely the lasers will increase urinary output and this can reduce the fluid accumulation. Okay, so if dipsnick. So if dipsnick or top neck is present, the patient is placed in semi-fowless position so here, you make sure that if the patient is nest in a high, high fowless or semi fowless position, it will help the patient to breathe better. So that is how you should nest this patient. Uh, so change the position regularly from side to side to prevent the skin breakdown. It's also encouraged. So patient is taught to monitor his or her own response to therapy by recording and evaluating fluid intake and output. The patient can himself give you a feedback that I breathe better, now I'm getting lighter and I can move about when they're getting tired. These are responses from the patient. 
emphasizes on the importance of adhering to medical regimen. So these are, so now we move on from fluid volume excess to edema. What's the difference between fluid volume excess and edema? Somebody is saying they didn't get the slides last week. I have posted the slides to you. I think I've given you the three separate slides and uh, you assess the platform, the WhatsApp platform where you can see it. I saw a chat right now from Lamte Rose. Rose, I have given you the slide on the WhatsApp page. Please assess it, okay? Yes, everybody can assess it now. So the notes is, are all in there, okay? Okay. Yes. Okay, so edema is an abnormal accumulation of serous fluid in the soft tissues. So here, the difference between edema and fluid volume excess is that in uh, fluid volume excess, you have both the, 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 the plasma, the whole of the plasma uh, fluids is pushed into the interstitial spaces. Uh, based on concentration differences. But with fluid volume excess or with edema, in edema, you only have the serous fluid moving into the tissue spaces. So here, what is the difference between serous fluid and the plasma? Yes, who can tell me the difference? Because in fluid volume excess, it is the plasma that is pushed into the interstitial spaces because of the concentration difference. But in edema, it is the serous fluid that goes there. What's the difference between the plasma and then the serous fluid? What's the difference? Yes. Yes, anybody? I will look onto the panel. Your names are all here. Those who attend the lectures every day, I capture your names. So, so your, the names are here. And I will mention some of the names if you don't respond. Yes anybody to give me the difference between serous fluid and plasma. What the difference? Serous fluid and plasma. The Lord will never be disappointed. Yes. The Lord will never, that is your, the Lord will never be disappointed. Yes. Can you help? Mm -hmm. Matilda, Woodrow. Matilda, unmute your microphone and help. Yes. Yes, okay, Williams. Williams wants to talk. Williams and then uh, Tita, ta, Tita, Tita, yes. Derek, Derek yeah, and, uh, yes. Good afternoon, Williams. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, so for the plasma, the plasma is um, uh, the component of the the blood and with the serious- I want my earpiece yeah, now. They are the fluid that are contained in the in the oh, cavity, yeah. and this uh, mm -hmm. mostly it contains um, water and uh, protein. So oh, that is a standing of serous fluid and uh, the plasma. Uh, uh, you are almost there, but it looks as if it's not that clear. You are almost there. You can make it more clearer. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, okay. Hello. Yes. Uh, hello. Yes. And this is Tata. Yes. All the, all the, Eric. All the blood. The blood. When you take the, the blood, the blood has the totality. And find the plasma inside the plasma is the liquid. Let me just say the liquid of the, the blood. Yes. So when which is normally found in the sickness and anchored by the plasma as it moves. But when you go into the serum flu, we are talking of flus within the serum membranes. And you know the human bodies, it is uh, it is made up of compartment and like the lines, they're from tick tick and normally when you feel them, they, they are like, they also feel bad, they, 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 they have some slippery the same. So they normally found within the cell membrane. So these fluids, when they move into the tissues, the soft tissues that they lie around, so they will come, they will now out. You, when you press the patients uh, or the 
part, that, that particular patient's body, you feel that there will be some pitting or you see your finger, there will be a mark of your finger because it is the fluid that was within the membrane, the serum membrane that has now absorbed up to the, uh, absorbed into the soft tissues. But the plasma is what the, uh, the liquid portion of the blood, when you separate it. Mm, okay. You separate it. What are you separating? When you separate Okay, when you when you, when you, you take the the motor, uh, when you take the blood and you put it inside, let me just even when the blood settles, excuse me to you the, the, the listen, when the blood settles, there will be some uh, uh, thick thick substance uh, down. The they are the cells of the this uh, the blood, but the lipid portion will not come out, and the, the lipid portion is what them as the plasma. Mm, okay. So it is the plasma that contains the flu. <laughs> anyway, anyway, yes. Oh, more, more hands are up. Okay, yes, let me hear you. It's, it's something straightforward. Uh, I, I don't know why uh, the explanation is too long. Anyway, yes, let me hear those who hands are up. Hello, sir. Yes. Please, can I say uh, plasma is a... Uh, uh, Liquid base of blood, while the serous fluid is the plasma without proteins. Okay. okay, okay. You said the plasma is the liquid base of blood, while the serous uh, fluid is the plasma without the protein. The plasma, the serous is plasma without the protein. Yes, I think I think you are getting it. Yes, yes, I think so. Sure. So it is it is simple. So you know the uh, the plasma, okay? The plasma, uh, the plasma is equal to the uh, serous fluid. Are you following? Yes, serous fluid yes, plus the plus the proteins. Are you following? So uh, the plasma contains the serous fluid plus the protein. So if you want the serous fluid, okay, that is equal to plasma minus the proteins, as you said. So once you take proteins from the plasma, the resultant fluid is called the serous fluid. Are you following? Yes, please. Are you following? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do, yes. Do, you see, do, yeah, do you see the whiteboard? Yes, yes. please. Yes, yes sir. Huh. Yes. yes. So if, if those who did elementary mathematics, if Plasma is equal to serous fluid plus the proteins. Now, if you want the serous fluid, it is plasma minus what? The proteins. So once you take proteins from the plasma, the resultant fluid is called the serous fluid. I hope it's clear. It's clear. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Very good. So it is simple. But you, you made the explanation too cumbersome. It was the, late, the, the last person who was... Uh, Clara. So that is it. So uh, in edema, so 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 in edema, we only ha have the serous fluid moving into the soft tissues to cause excessive accumulation of fluid in the soft tissue and not the whole of the plasma volume. I hope the explanation is clear. Now. So location of edema is influenced by gravity, definitely. Uh, so, uh, so once you, you keep on standing, definitely fluids will be collected in the lower parts of the body.
in the lower parts of the body, the sacral area, when you are bed ready or when you are lying in bed for long and you are edema or there's edema, you see that fluid be collected around the sacral area, the ankles and the feet, if you are ambulatory, because of the, uh, the, the, the gravity acting on you, you have fluids accumulating around the ankles and then the feet. And it pits with pressure. Once you press on it, there's pitting edema. So that is weight gain occurs prior to clinical evidence of edema. Definitely weight goes with fluid accumulation. So once you retain fluids, it adds up to your weight. So edema is a late sign of heart failure. Once you are having heart failure, definitely you'll be experiencing signs of edema. We can assess based on mild, moderate, and severe. If it's mild, it's uh, zero to above. It is moderate, it's one over two. That's half of it. If it is severe, you have three quarters of it. So these are the categories or the classification of edema based upon severity or the mild aspect of it. Dehydration is said to have been occurred if there is loss of water from the body with increased sodium serum, also referred to as decreased extracellular fluid volume. So here dehydration is simple, is a simple loss of water from the body, remaining the solute, which is the sodium. So uh, the causes are almost the same as the causes for fluid volume deficit, as I did with you. So we have severe diarrhea. Once you are having diarrhea and vomiting, uh, definitely you are losing fluids. Hemorrhage, you are losing blood, and the blood, the highest composition is fluids. Once you lose blood, you lose fluids. Once you lose fluids, you lose blood. Okay, inadequate fluid intake. You are not having enough fluid to take. We talk about it in fluid volume deficit. It's almost the same as dehydration. Excessive sweating, diaphoresis. Once you sweat excessively, you are losing fluids. Sometimes you could see that once you sweat on the skin, the skin, the sweat dries, you could see some crystals of salt on the skin. And that tells you the sodium that has been dried out. Suppression of antidiuretic hormone. Yes. So once the hormone is in place, then definitely urine is not produced. But once you suppress the release of ADH, definitely you produce volumes of urine. And once you are producing volumes of urine, you are losing fluids and the body is dehydrated. Bands, you know, the body loses fluids once you have bands. High body temperature in paresia or high temperature, you lose fluids. So that is how you lose fluids. The signs and symptoms are the same as FVD. Weight loss, general weakness, rapid pause for compensation, reduced integral, dry mouth, tongue, and pharynx, sunken eyes and soft balls or eyeballs, oliguria, reduction in saliva, increasing your mouth becomes dry. There are sores around the mouth. High temperature because you need good blood volume to distribute heat equally and uniformly. Once you are dehydrated and the blood volume reduces. Temperature is trapped at a certain part and reduction of temperature becomes a problem. So sometimes in pediatrics, once temperature is not reducing, you check the HB level and hydration level and see that they are severely dehydrated and they are anemic. Fall in blood pressure. The amount of water influences the amount of blood and the amount of blood influences the amount or high the blood pressure will either be high or low. So once you have reduced blood pressure because of dehydration, the pressure will fall significantly. You experience hypotension or hypovolemia. Sunken fontanels in children. In children who are dehydrated and having diarrhea, their fontanels sunk in, and that is a sign of dehydration. Okay. So laboratory investigation revealed the following results. There'll be increased hemoglobin, reduction in plasma volume because of reduced blood, there'll be reduction in plasma volume. Once you are losing fluids, you are losing it from the plasma volume. Increased blood, urea, nitrogen, and cryotin. You need good blood volume to flush the kidneys. Once the blood volumes are low, the waste are retained. So there'll be increased urea, nitrogen, and cryotin. So treatment is to encourage the intake in severe, in less severe cases, if there is no vomiting, the patient can be using or can be encouraged to use oral rehydration salt, uh, coconut water, other preparations of homemade salt and water, uh, uh, kinky, mash kinky, and other preparations we can use to restore uh, unfermented 
uh, uh, one fermented uh, pito. Uh, pito is good, shobolo is good, and other preparations. Okay, in case of severe, we need the intravenous route to restore the blood volume as fast as possible. Then we said we need to treat underlying cause. If there's fever and you don't treat the infection, the temperature will keep on rising up and the flow will dry up. So we treat the underlying cause. If there's nausea and vomiting, treat the nausea and vomiting. If there's any infection, treat it, and the fluids will be retained. Now, today we are looking at fluid to light imbalance, that is uh, how fluids are distributed across the body. And I have already explained to you that uh, we have uh, these. Let me let me let me demonstrate to you before I move on. I am for The noise some of you are making. You see the noise? You see the noise? The person is yes, Amina Muhammad. It's like at the magazine. I don't know what she is doing there. And she's disturbing so much. That's why I'm quiet. Ladies too. You see? I'll, I'll forgive them because probably it's the first time they are joining. Okay. So, uh, Lisa, uh, you mute all of us. You mute once you mute, and the other people join, then the noise comes back okay. again. So, you have to stop and go and mute okay. anyway. Let me let me go on okay. with my explanation. So, we have the compact two compartments. You have the 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 you have the the ECF, and then we have the ICF. So the ECF is the extracellular fluid volume and we have the intracellular fluid volume. So fluid outside the cell. So let's take this, these two cells. So fluids within the cell are called the intracellular fluid and it takes two tests of the total fluid volume and fluid outside the cell is called the extracellular fluid and it takes one third of the total fluid volume. And under the extracellular fluid, we have the intravascular fluid, which is the fluid found within the blood, capillary, basically the plasma, and then the lymph node or the lymphatics, the lymphs. And we have the in, in, interstitia. Interstitia, that is fluid found in between the cells. If you have more than one cell, Fluid that are found in between the cells are the interstitial fluid. And we have the transcellular. That is fluid found between the small, small, the smaller 
spaces. The smaller spaces. So all these come under the extracellular fluid volume. So under the extracellular fluid volume, we have the IVF, the interstitial fluid volume, and then we have the transcellular fluid volume. So these things are how explains how the body distributes fluid among these compartments. Now uh, we are going to go into a broad topic and it's called so these are examples of anions and then cations that we deal. basically we are going to deal with two uh, 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 basic ions two basic yeah. ions so our first we are going to look at metabolic acidosis. So when we talk about metabolic acidosis, we also mean that we are talking about bicarbonate deficit. So I'm going to explain to you the pH scale when we talk about uh, acidosis and alkalosis, we are referring to a pH scale. So metabolic acidosis can also be called bicarbonate deficit, which means that in terms of acidosis, you should have a low bicarbonate level, but a high pH of a high concentration of hydrogen. So let me take time and explain to you using the, using the board. So you know the various elements that we deal with. I called the, I called, I called the IT guy to help me share the screen to you, yes. You can have access to the screen now, right? Yep. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So I mean the whiteboard. Can you see the whiteboard yes, now? Yes. 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 Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes, sir. yes, sir. That's good. Yes, sir. That's good. So uh we are going to learn or revise something we learned in SS. We have the PA skill. So from the PA skill. Okay, this and this. So we have the model here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, and this is seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Okay, so eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we have eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So we say that the seven is neutral from what we did in excess. We all remember that. So yeah. all yes. figures closer to one, as you move from seven to one, there's an increasing acidity. So the acidity of solution increases as the pH becomes low. If the pH is low, it means there's increased acidity. If the pH becomes high or the pH value increases, then there's increasing alkalinity. So there's increasing alkalinity. So here you have the pH scale. At the lower values of the pH, if you enter into the acidic medium. At the higher values of the pH, you go into alkalinity. So anytime you go into alkaline medium, there's increased pH value, true or false? True. True, sir. Every time you go, you have a higher pH value, there is alkaline medium, true or false? It's true. Any time you have a low pH value, there is acidic medium, true or false? It's true. 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 Very yes, good. Sir. Very good. Now, if you are in the alkaline medium, you are having bicarbonate in place. And this is the formula for bicarbonate. Now we are all going to remember our bicarbonate that we did. So once you are in alkaline medium, there's increased bicarbonate ions. Once you are acidic medium, there's increased hydrogen ion concentration. So here you have increased hydrogen ion in alkaline medium and increased hydrogen ion in high pH in acidity medium. I hope it is clear. Yes, sir. 
Yes. These are basic biochemistry that we did. And we need to revise them to understand what we are going to do. So once you have high concentrations of hydrogen ions, you are in the acidic medium. And once you have high concentration of bicarbonate ions, bicarbonate ions, then you are in the alkaline medium. So we are going to play with these ions. And once we mention bicarbonate deficits, so in and in a, in a solution where you have high concentration of hydrogen, then you have low concentration of bicarbonate ions. In solution where you have high concentration of bicarbonate ions, we have low concentration of hydrogen ions. I hope you are getting me. Hello, sir. Yes. Your voice, yes. your voice is down uh -huh, a little my, bit. Oh, okay, yes. I'm a bit away from the microphone. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Very good. Yes, I'm saying that once no. you have high concentration of hydrogen ions, then you should have a low bicarbonate ions because the two cannot be the same in an acidic medium. So in an acidic medium where you are expecting high concentration of hydrogen ions, then equally or simultaneously, you are having a low bicarbonate ion. On the other hand, in the solution that you have high concentration of bicarbonate ion, where you are talking about alkalinity or basic medium, then you are having a low hydrogen ion concentration. So that is how the solutions behave. You cannot have an alkaline medium where you have high bicarbonate ions at the same time, high hydrogen ions it cannot be like that. So once bicarbonate ions are high, then you are having a low hydrogen ion concentration. Once you have high hydrogen ion concentration, then you're having a low bicarbonate ion concentration. I hope it is clear. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Very good. So this yes, is what sir. we are sir. going to use, yes, to explain. I, 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 I have, I've, not, I've not gotten uh, the, the, the point where, where you said, like uh, at one particular point, like the, 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 there's much water concentration than the, uh, the other. No, let me, let me explain to you. When you are in the acidic medium, okay? And you are having mm. a very low pH, like acidic medium. For example, you are having a pH of say, pH of two, which is indication of acidic medium. Are you with me? Then you are yes. having a high concentration of hydrogen ions, okay? At the same time, you cannot have high bicarbonate ions because already the solution have already have high hydrogen ion concentration. So oh, the only thing you can have is a low bicarbonate ions in the acidic medium. Do you understand it? Yes, sir. Very yes, good. sir. Very good. And this describes an acidic solution. Let's move to the alkaline solution or alkalosis. In the solution where you have high pH value, a pH value of say uh, uh, eight or say 10, it indicates that the solution is alkaline. And in an alkaline medium, you have high concentration of bicarbonate ions. And once you have high concentration of bicarbonate ions, you should have a low concentration of hydrogen ions. They are supposed to be low because you cannot have high bicarbonate at the same time, high hydrogen is not possible. I hope it's clear now. Yes, sir. Very good. Yes, sir. Very good. Now, let us move into the discussion point. Okay, so we are saying that metabolic acidosis, we are in acidic medium, right? And therefore we should have bicarbonate deficit because we are in acidic medium. There's no way bicarbonate to be high. It should be a deficit. I hope it is clear now. Yes, please. Very good. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, let's see. 
the letter somebody tested, can I grant the permission to record them? The letter has been recorded. It is with the IT people. So contact them. The reps should contact them. They give them to you. Uh, I don't know. I don't control the lecture anymore. That is why I'm in the studio now with you. You know, I have moved out of the house to the studio to be able to interact with you nicely without pictures of the network. And now everything is in the hands of the IT people, okay? Uh, they have recorded everything. Yes, somebody's hand is up. Let me hear you. My voice is low, right? It's okay now. Mm -hmm. It's okay, 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 okay. I let me when I'm out of the microphone, I'll get closer. Okay. Sure. Now, uh, I feel now you can you I mean you can hear me now. Sure. So the mm -hmm. IT people will update you with the recordings and everything. Okay. All right. So now we are talking about metabolic acidosis and they say the same as bicarbonate deficit. It is a clinical disturbance characterized by, because we are in acidic media, characterized by a low pH and an increased hydrogen ion concentration after demonstrating with you understand why in a low pH, the hydrogen ions concentrations are high. So in a low pH, always the hydrogen ion concentrations are high. And also a very low plasma bicarbonate ions. Once the hydrogen ion concentration is high, the plasma should always have a very low bicarbonate ions. Just explanation I have finished giving you right now. How do you produce? It can be produced by a gain of hydrogen ions or a loss of bicarbonate ions. So a gain of hydrogen ion will always increase the concentration of hydrogen in an acidic medium. And a loss of bicarbonate ions always lead to a bicarbonate deficit. So it can the solution can become possible in metabolic acidosis by a gain of hydrogen ion concentration and a loss of bicarbonate ions. I hope it's clear. Yes, yes sir. Let's look at the causes. The causes of this uh, solution is one of the questions called ketoacidosis in diabetes mellitus. You could remember in diabetes mellitus, a condition called uh, diabetic ketoacid DKA. Have you heard about it before? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. And uh, you know how it happens, DKA. How does it happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, 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 yes. How does it happen? Okay. So in DKA, the in diabetic ketoacidosis, you know, the organ responsible here to produce insulin is the pancreas. I hope you are all aware. Very good. Yeah. Now, the pancreas, the pancreas is, is, is somebody has, somebody has opened open, open the, open the microphone and it's giving me a Okay, so the pancreas is responsible for producing insulin. I hope it's clear. And now the insulin has a duty to do. What does it do? The insulin picks up the glucose in the blood and fix them into the cells, thereby reducing the blood glucose levels. In situations where the pancreas is unable to produce enough insulin, what happens to the glucose levels. The glucose levels in the blood increases because there's no insulin or very little insulin to metabolize the glucose from the blood and fix them into the cells. So in diabetes mellitus, what happens is that there is too much glucose in the blood, but there's no insulin to pick the glucose and fix them into the cells. So what happens is that the cells undergo what is called uh, the cell starvation. So the cells are starving because they don't receive adequate glucose because there's no insulin to supply them with the glucose. So the cells advise themselves. The, when they advise themselves, they go through two processes. The first process is called glycogenolysis, where they act on the stored glycogen and release energy from the stored glycogen, a process called glycogenolysis. The waste that is generated is keto acid or ketone bodies. And the ketone bodies will always make the solution ketoacidosis. 
because it contains acid. Now, another process is called gluconeogenesis. In gluconeogenesis, the body falls on the proteins of the cells and convert them to energy. So conversion of energy, uh, 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 acting on the protein cells and convert them into energy will give you a lot of waste. And the, one of the waste is ketones. And once you generate energy from protein sources, you generate a lot of ketone bodies. And that also makes the solution acidic. So in diabetes mellitus, where glucose is trapped in the blood, definitely the cells are going to advise themselves to generate energy from uh, other sources. And that leads to accumulation of extra waste, which is ketone bodies, which has built up. And that will make the solution ketoacidotic. So this is explanation to why the body can become metabolic acidosis from diabetes mellitus. So if you have a patient on the ward who is going through uh, DKA, that particular time, you should know that there is metabolic acidosis going on. So you know how to handle that particular patient. No wonder the patient will be breathing very fast and there's increased respiratory and so on and so forth. So understand the phenomenon of diabetic mellitus in DKA. We have lactic acidosis. Yes, I have a follow-up question on the diabetes. Let me, let me, let me finish. I will allow you to ask questions. Lactic acid, write your question down. Lactic acidosis. So in lactic acidosis, you know there is always the need for oxygen to combine with glucose. And in oxygen combining with glucose, it yields energy and other water vapors, waste products. So in a situation where you are having activity going on, you should have enough oxygen and enough energy. Enough oxygen combines with enough energy in the form of glucose to give you energy and water vapor as an example. Energy is in the form of ATP. So when you are doing strenuous activity, when you are doing extra activity and you don't have enough oxygen, you may have glucose all right, but you don't have enough oxygen. In an anaerobic respiration, lack of oxygen will be acted upon by carbohydrate. So carbohydrate, instead of carbohydrate being acted upon by oxygen, in this situation, carbohydrate has been acted upon by carbon dioxide. And this leads to, instead of energy being produced, you produce what is called lactic acid. So lactic acid are small granules. And these are deposited in between the muscles. And this leads to the muscle cramps or the muscle pool experienced by athletes who are having a marathon, normally experience muscle pool. The muscle pools as a result of accumulation of lactic acid because they might have exhausted oxygen and they don't have enough oxygen to act on the glucose to produce adequate ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Rather, carbon dioxide acts on glucose and produces lactic acid. And these are granules that are deposited in between the muscles and that leads to the muscle pool experienced by athletes and other marathon. We have uremia excess in the blood. Uremia excess in the blood, how does uremia being produced? It's produced from kidney or renal failure. If the kidneys are unable to work effectively, increase the glomerular filtration rate to excrete one of their major wastes, which is uremia. The uremia or urea is one of the wastes. If the kidney function declines, it is a normal idea. Someone did someone. If the kidney function declines and you have the waste, which is urea, building up in the blood instead of the kidney excreting them the kidney is not able to excrete them because its function has been declined or has gone down then there's a buildup of urea and urea is acidic so it definitely makes the whole body acidic so you have uremia excess in the blood and it turns the body into acidosis we have hyperkalemia excess in the blood when you have too much potassium in the blood Potassium, we know, is uh, found inside the cell. 
and sodium is found outside the cell. So during situations of hyperglycemia, uh, you would realize that in hyperglycemia, glucose levels are high, but the cell itself is starving. So in the process of gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, the cells rigorously push potassium from inside and they become available in the extracellular fluid. So during hyperglycemic states, as I explained to you with ketoacidosis, the process of gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis push potassium from inside the cell and they become more available in the extracellular fluid compartment. So it also makes the solution acidic. Dehydration. Dehydration here, you are experiencing something similar to renal failure. In the dehydration, the kidneys are dried up. It has affected the blood volume. So the urine is supposed to be produced by flushing the waste from the body. But because you are experiencing dehydration, the amount of blood in the circulatory system is reduced and therefore affected the blood volume. So the blood is not able to clear the waste from the circulatory system. So you have urea and other waste, creatinine and other waste trapped in circulation, and that turns the body into acidosis. Then we have shock-like syndromes, or in shock-like states, once the body goes into shock, blood is trapped into stasis, so the stasis of blood, and blood is not moving to the kidneys to produce enough urine. Once it does that, metabolic waste keep on accumulating, and it turns the body into acidosis. The first person, let me hear you, raise up your hand. Let me hear you, your question, and I can address you before I move on. Yes, the person who raised up the hand. I've read a chat and you were saying, should we tell the lactic acidosis again? What I said about lactic acidosis is that... Yes. Hello. Okay. So in lactic acidosis, I'm saying that, okay, let me just go back to this and uh, So uh, so in lactic acidosis, what happens? We are saying so that please the microphone is far. Okay, okay, okay. okay. We are saying that message. yes, in lactic acidosis, we are saying that you have always uh, you have oxygen. Oxygen combining with glucose. Okay. And giving you uh, carbon dioxide and water plus ATP. So if you have glucose, which is CCH, H2O6, and you have oxygen, it gives you the energy you require. Okay. And then the waste. Now, in the absence of oxygen, when you are exercising, you are running a marathon, this oxygen is replaced by CO2, which is carbon dioxide, because you have become exhausted and you don't have enough oxygen to act on the carbohydrates to give you the energy required. Instead, carbon dioxide will rather act on the glucose. And instead of energy, the form of ATP to give you lactic acid. And this lactic acid I explained is granules of small, small salt, which are deposited in the muscles. And that brings about the muscle pool experienced by athletes and footballers when they are extremely tired. And this is what I explained. If it happens around the myocardium, then it's called angina, which is also as a result of oxygen or lack of oxygen. So if it happens to the muscles, it is muscle pool. It happens to the myocardium. It is angina. I hope it's clear.
Is it clear now? Yes, sir. Very yes, good. Yes, yes, sir. Very good. Very good. Okay, so we can move on. Okay, so if there are no questions, I'll move on to alcoholism. Please, I have a question. Let's hear you. Okay, so I'm to follow up on the ketoacidosis. Is there a other problem that can contribute to the ketoacidosis? Like if the ketones are they can't the body remove it, or there's always another problem with the body that makes it unable to excrete it, then that will lead to the ketoacidosis. We we the, we're talking about we are talking about situations that can cause it. But I've explained to you that the body works in an equilibrium or homeostasis. Once it builds up and everything is all right, the body can correct it and brings back to normal. And it does that with the right environment and the right atmosphere. If you have metabolic acidosis and you don't have enough fluids, enough oxygen, how does the body correct it? The body corrects it when there is the favorable environment, when there is the right time or the right atmosphere. If you are running and you are having lactic acidosis and you don't stop to get the oxygen back, how do you want the body to correct it? If you are running, you have exhausted, you have, have so much sweat and you are dehydrated, you don't drink to replace the fluids, to balance the fluid, how does the body correct it? So the body corrects it based upon the cause. If you are having dehydration and you have accumulated so much waste in the circulatory system and you don't have enough fluid to flush the urea, the creatinine, and the other toxic substances from the kidneys, if you don't have enough fluid to flush it, how do you expect the body to correct it? So the body corrects it in the right environment, in the right atmosphere. Okay, we can move on. Okay. So we have the next course. Or oh, do you still have some questions? Do you still have some questions or we should move on? All right. So alcoholism. Yeah, please, I, have I, had, I had wanted you to repeat the, uh, the metabolic or the bicarbonate deficit uh, for me. Re repeat I, what? Uh, there are a lot of causes. What exactly do you want? No, the, the metabolic acidosis itself. It's just a buildup of hydrogen ions with a low pH and a deficit of bicarbonate. That is what describes the metabolic acidosis. And I did that using the pH scale to explain. Yeah. I hope it's clear. Yeah, my network wasn't clear. Right. Okay. Okay. I did this with the panel explaining that with the, with, the, with, the, with the whiteboard. So I have done justice to that. Okay. Alcoholism is one of the causes for metabolic acidosis. And in alcoholism, the alcohol itself is acidic. And so once you take in a lot of uh, alcohol, Let you have body... a question. <clears throat> write down your question. I'll give you time to, otherwise I can't move on. So write down your question. So alcoholism, is itself is, uh, is, is, is acidic and therefore once you take too much alcoholism you poison the body the body becomes acidotic uh, salicylate poisoning here you have salicylate as aspirin aspirin its name is acetyl salicylic acid once you take a lot of this drug mm -hmm. the body becomes metabolic acidotic methanol or ethylene poisoning toxicity methanol itself is an acid and once you take a lot of them the body becomes acidotic starvation starvation behaves as if you are having hyperglycemia in starvation the cells are not getting enough glucose just as it happens in hyperglycemia and you need to survive the cells need to survive so the cell advise themselves to undergo the two processes we mentioned as gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis generating a lot of ketone bodies that turns the body into acidosis then we have diarrhea as a cause of dehydration. So when there's severe diarrhea, there is 
when there is severe diarrhea, there is there is dehydration. And when there is dehydration, there is waste that is trapped in the circulatory system, and definitely is going to make the body uh, acidotic. Intestinal fistula, intestinal fistula. So uh, intestinal fistula, you lose fluids, and once you are losing fluids through the fistula, you are becoming dehydrated, and it's a, like a cause of dehydration. Excessive gain of chloride. Once you are gaining more chloride, it will combine with sodium to form sodium chloride. And once they become more, once they become more, the sodium chloride becomes more, you have, uh, uh, so the sodium chloride definitely will push, will, will push, will, will move out and will be replaced by potassium. So once there is more sodium chloride to be excreted, and therefore potassium will be, uh, you, you, your potassium will be maintained rather than sodium. So definitely you have sodium chloride moving out, replaced by potassium in the circulatory system. Okay, so diagnosis. So let me hear your questions. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Yes, afternoon. Yeah, please, what you were saying pertaining to the athletes, Normally, um, let me say after you've uh, a round of, if let me say after you've taken your training, um, running, they normally give a uh, glucose, yes. and the explanation they give that it will replace lost energy. Yes. But looking at the explanation you gave, it means that during that time you need oxygen rather, because you it said it's not only oxygen. You need it to you exhaust the energy as well as the oxygen. So you, you become breathless, so you breathe faster to replace. You need, you have exhausted the glucose levels inside you. So you need a two. Any one of them can lead to lactic acidosis. Oh, okay. So meaning that the glucose that they give to that lettuce really works. I didn't tell you that glucose is not part. I said oxygen and other, you know, you are using energy to run. Definitely other one, you should know it. I shouldn't even mention it. You should know. Once you are exhausting, running around. Since you are far from the mic. I'm not far from the mic. Mike, I'm with the, the mic is in front of me. So you always make sure that you are running a marathon and use energy to run. And you don't expect <laughs> to have enough glucose after running. Definitely glucose level will fall as well as oxygen. So uh, that one, you should know that. Yes. So if they give glucose, that is right to restore the glucose level and therefore oxygen will combine with it and restore the energy. So that is, that is it. All right. Okay, so let's look at diagnosis. Arterial blood gas measurements. So if you have a question, please write it down. We don't want people to at least draw this back as we move on. We will have time to address every question. Just put your question down, we'll address it for you. Arterial blood gas measurements. If you want to diagnose somebody with metabolic acidosis, you are going to record a low bicarbonate level. You know we are dealing with acidic medium and therefore the bicarbonate level should be low and it should be less than 22 millimeters or millimole per liter. We are in acidic medium, you expect a pH level less than 7.35. Definitely, we said hyperkalemia, potassium will be shifted from inside to outside, so due to shift of potassium, and therefore, you would record high potassium levels in the blood, and you have low arterial carbon dioxide. Okay, so the signs and symptoms, there's headache, weakness, confusion, drowsiness, Increased respiratory rate and depth, 
So here it's like we have finished running a marathon. And once we finish running a race, what do you see? You see increased respiratory rates and depth. You breathe. You, you breathe deep and out, trying to bring out more carbon dioxide and take on fresh oxygen because you have accumulated so much carbon dioxide inside you and you need to bring them out. Nausea and vomiting, definitely nausea and vomiting will lead to dehydration. Decrease cardiac output, increase urine volume, increase urine acidity because you are dealing with acidic medium and there's peripheral dilatation and coma. Sometimes you can even go into coma in an extreme cases. So once you run, you see there's increased uh, 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 activity of the heart. So you see that the veins and the capillaries are dilated and you have peripheral dilatation because there's increased blood activity. Management. The treatment is directed at the metabolic effect. If the cause of the acidosis in excess intake of chloride, what do you need to do? You need to stop. If necessary, we said there's a deficit of bicarbonate. Why not infuse or transfuse the person or infuse the person transfusions here and infusions? So here you look at solution that contain bicarbonate and then you infuse the person with that particular solution. So we restore bicarbonate level back. And we said at the beginning that there's a deficit of bicarbonate. So if we are managing it, then we need to restore bicarbonate to normal and therefore to correct the acidosis and bring the person back to neutral pH. After that, we add the routine nursing care, which are feeding, bathing, mouth care. So you feed the person, get the person enough nutrients bath the person to remove the sweat and other things. Give the person mouth care because of mouth breathing. Check the vital signs. Monitor to make sure that the person is in a very normotensive state. Intake and output. Make sure the person is not dehydrated. Check elimination levels. So all these routine nursing care is added to the care. Before I move to metabolic alkalosis, let me hear and take your questions on metabolic acidosis where I can move to alkalosis. Okay. Some people have said they can't hear me. I don't know. Uh, is my voice that faint? Yes, please. It's faint. It's, it's faint. Yeah, sometimes, not all. No, if when it is faint, eh? Then it is your network at your area. So you check your network at your area. If the network is disturbing or is fluctuating, definitely the voice may be feigning. Okay? Because the microphone is almost touching my, my mouth. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, the voice is okay from Catherine. So the voice is okay now. Uh, anyway, that is the network. Yes. Any question from you before I move on? The person who wanted to ask a question, I said, write it down. Please let me hear your question so I can move on to metabolic alkalosis. Yes. She is not forthcoming. Okay, let's move on. So metabolic alkalosis, we are saying that it is a bicarbonate excess, bicarbonate excess. So uh, are you asking questions, Eric Akoto and uh, uh, who else? Okay, let's hear you. Yes, Alex, Alex and Derek, you want to ask questions? Let's hear you, please. Yes, for me, it is uh, on the... Metabolic acidosis, when we were looking at some of the, like when we were saying diarrhea and the excess chlorine, I want to find out whether diarrhea, the person may be losing some ions, like maybe but some ions. True. Yes. So I'm looking at it like, can, it, can someone say that because the person is running the diarrhea and potassium compartment, the uh, um, potassium uh, compartment, like there is a shift in it. So a lot Definitely. of people, yes, you are losing yeah, from okay. inside to outside yes, yourself. To our, yes, oh, it's part oh. of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then it 
can can I also say that due to the excessive um, uh, chlorine in the system, you know, mm -hmm. uh, chlorine is a uh, an anion, then potassium is a, a, a this um, cation. So, and you know, when they combine, when potassium and potassium and chlorine combine to give like, let me just say, so like potassium chloride. So once a lot of uh, this um, a lot of chlorine are inside the system, then potassium has to move out to attract uh, uh, chlorine. So once it is moving out from the cells, it will also be causing, it will also be uh, inducing more as acid in the system. So, that, Derek, the yes. sodium will rather combine with chloride. Oh, so there okay. will be sodium chloride okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. excess. Yeah, and therefore yeah, the yeah, kidney yeah. will have to expel them out. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And once they push out of the body, it will be replaced by potassium. Okay. Uh, thank yes. you. Thank you. Sodium thank you. will not leave. Uh, chloride will not leave sodium to bind with potassium. No, it will rather bind with uh, yeah. chloride. Okay. Mm. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm. Okay. So we can. Is there any other thing? Uh, any? Yes. Alex, your hand is up. Let's hear you. Yes, please. Um. I want to know why there will be increased human output in the uh, in science but an uh, increased urine output. Uh in the yeah, the science, science and symptoms. Yeah, so I want to know why. Okay, you want to know why? Yeah. Yes, it is an attempt to correct the electrolytes, especially. Uh, they want to balance the acidosis, so the kidney responds by doing that. So a lot of chloride is excreted, and other sides replaced. So if the kidney is not, you know, the, there's increased hemodynamic rate, there's increased metabolic rate. All the activities are high, and therefore the the kidney cannot remain dormant. You understand? The kidney needs to work in response to the hemodynamic systems in the body. Thank you, sir. Yes. During exertional activity, every organ is actively playing a role. You don't expect the kidney to remain dormant here. The kidney must work. Let's create the waste and balance the electrolytes. Okay. Any other? Okay. I think uh, we are okay. Or oh, Eric Akoto, can we move on? Okay, so yes, please, sir. Sir, please. Um, my question is, um, I would want to um get more understanding as to how alcoholism and then salicylate poisoning cause uh, metabolic acidosis. Humbly, they Thank are you. they are itself acidic. I mentioned this. They are they are themselves acidic. Uh, aspirin is salic acid as and salic acid. It's an acid itself. If you take it in extreme doses, definitely you are going. That is why even ulcer patients don't take it because you are causing more acidic production in the GIT and it's causing irritations. So the substance itself is acidic as well as alcohol. I mentioned it. Okay. So that's okay. Metabolic alkalosis, bicarbonate acids. In metabolic acidosis, there were bicarbonate deficit. So in metabolic alkalosis, there should be bicarbonate excess. It's just an opposite to what we did earlier. So please put your questions down, write them down. There will be time for you to ask questions. I don't want that when explanations are going on, it, it doesn't flow. So write your questions down. There'll be time for you to ask questions. With a clinical disturbance characterized by a high pH, because we are talking about bicarbonate or alkalosis, we are in a high pH medium. So it's characterized by a high pH and a high plasma bicarbonate concentration. So you have high plasma bicarbonate concentration and we have uh, in alkalosis and a low bicarbonate in acidosis. But in alkalosis, we have high plasma bicarbonate concentration and a low uh, hydrogen ion concentration. So these two, I told you earlier, they cannot exist in the same amount unless you are talking about a neutral solution. So once bicarbonate concentration is high in alkalosis, definitely hydrogen ion concentration will be low. 
All right. Or loss of gain by, it can produced by gain of bicarbonate or loss of hydrogen ions. Let's look at the causes. Vomiting here, in respect to vomiting out the HCL in the, uh, in the gastric juice. So once you are throwing out, you are throwing out and you are causing the release or uh, output of the ACL and therefore the body remains alkalosis. So that is it. Gastric suction. Somebody might have taken poisonous substances and the person is uh, put down to allow the nurses to use the NG tube to suck the substance from being absorbed. And while they are sucking, they can suck and suck the gastric juice. They are sucking the ACL. Loss of potassium, such as potassium losing diuretics, such as fruzimide. So once you put patients on uh, lasers or fruzimide, they don't spare potassium. They push potassium through the urine and you lose potassium. So we mentioned that hyperkalemia can cause acidosis as well. Hypokalemia can cause alkalosis. So once you are losing potassium, the body turns into alkalosis. Excessive adrenocorticotrophic hormone as in Cushing syndrome. Here, I explained to you the other time that once there is hyperactivity of the adrenal cortex, especially if you have delivered before and you are trying to put on weight, you are trying to take more blood tonic, you are trying to take uh, more paratin to stimulate appetite for you to eat, you are trying to increase the retention of sodium because the adrenal cortex release aldosterone to retain more sodium and the sodium itself also retain fluids and that will expand the extracellular fluid compartment. And this we describe as Cushing syndrome when it combines with excessive intake of uh, carbohydrate food because you are taking steroids and the steroids you eat a lot. And once you take a lot of carbohydrates, it increases metabolism of carbohydrates. So you metabolize carbohydrates at the upper part of the body and the abdomen and then the cheeks and it makes you beautiful and the lower limbs are thin and they are unmetabolized. So you see that your top is big and your legs are slim. So in uh, Cushing syndrome or excessive adrenocotrophic hormone, there is metabolic alkalosis because of the activity of the aldosterone. Hypokalemia. The kidneys conserve potassium and lose or excrete hydrogen ions and potassium moves out of the cell into the extracellular fluid. So once we are talking about this, it can be a cause, hypokalemia. So the kidney will definitely conserve hydrogen ions and excrete this. Excessive alkaline injection. Excessive alkaline injection. Once you inject alkaline substances like allodrops, like tricylicate, like antacids, Definitely, you are reducing the acidic content and replacing it with uh, alkaline because the substances and the medications are basic substances and therefore you reduce the alkaline and the body becomes alkalosis. Okay, in diagnosis, definitely there will be a high pH greater than 7.45. Serum bicarbonate concentration is going to be higher because you are going to have increased hydrogen ion concentration, like bicarbonate oh. ion concentration, higher than 26 millimole per liter. High partial pressure of carbon dioxide as the lungs attempt to compensate for the excess bicarbonate by retaining carbon dioxide. So the carbon will combine with the bicarbonate to form carbonic acid. Awesome. So you will have more, uh, the more carbon dioxide at the lungs. Hypokalemia, we said hypokalemia always seen in alkalosis and hyperkalemia is seen in acidosis. Before I move on to the signs and symptoms, any questions so I can attempt and answer that? Any questions? Any questions? If there are none, then we move on. So we have tingling of fingers and toes. So you see that you have tingling around the fingers and toes in metabolic alkalosis. You feel dizzy, you feel dizzy, so the dizziness. So let me describe somebody in metabolic alkalosis like you have eating and you are sitting in your armchair and you are resting and you feel dozing so that you start going through, you start dozing off. 
hypertonic muscle, muscle cramps. So that sometimes you feel muscle cramps, decrease respiratory rate and death. When you are resting your armchair, it's not like when you have run a hundred meter race and you are panting. In your armchair, you, the respiratory rate and depth are all decreased because you are in a relaxed state and all the organs are relaxing. So you don't expect the kidney to be in serious activity and under organs. In metabolic alkalosis, you are relaxing. In metabolic acidosis, you are hyperactivity or you are in a hyperactivity state. So the two states are entirely different. So definitely the kidneys are also relaxed and you see there's decreased urine activity or, or uh, decreased urine acidity. There'll be nausea and vomiting. There'll be diarrhea. Cardiac arrhythmia is due to potassium loss. Potassium has a direct effect on myocardium. As you lose potassium, you have cardiac arrhythmia because you need potassium to stimulate the electrical conduction of the heart. And therefore, with that potassium, there will be arrhythmias and there will be abnormal conduction. And once we have hypokalemia, there is poor conductivity around the heart. Twitching due to potassium. As you are losing potassium, you're also losing calcium. So once you lose calcium together with potassium, there will be twitchings here and there or tremors because of calcium loss. How do you manage the condition? So we reverse the underlying course. We give sufficient chloride for the kidneys to reabsorb sodium chloride, which allows the excretion of excess bicarbonate. So once we, we give sufficient chloride for the kidney to absorb sodium chloride, we excrete, the, uh, there's always excess bicarbonate. So once you absorb sodium chloride, you excrete the bicarbonate. A demonstration of normal fluid volume by normal saline. So uh, once you give sodium, you excrete the bicarbonate and the condition becomes reversed. Then we add the routine nursing care. What are the routine nursing care? We are talking about feeding, we are talking about bathing, we are talking about elimination, vital signs. We add all of them. Okay, any question so far? Any question? Yes. Uh, please, mm -hmm. I, I had wanted to ask if uh, severe bleeding can cause metabolic acidosis. Yes, bleeding because you are losing blood, you are losing fluids, you are losing, and the blood becomes, the volume becomes low. Definitely, it can cause. It can. Thank you. Okay. So, respiratory acidosis or carbonic acid excess. So, I say it's a clinical disorder in which the pH is less than. Always, we are in acidosis, despite the fact that we are talking about respiratory. Uh, we are still in acidosis. So uh, the pH is also less than 7.35 and the arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide is greater than 44 millimeters of mercury. It can be chronic or acute. So always here the reference is because it's respiratory and reference is acidosis, carbon dioxide is greater than 42 millimeters of mercury and you have the pH in acidic medium is less than 7.35. Let's look at the causes of uh, respiratory acidosis. The main cause is hypoventilation related to, so anytime you are experiencing uh, hypoventilation, anytime you are experiencing hypoventilation, you are causing uh, more oxygen to be, uh, or more carbon dioxide to be retained because of poor exchange of gases. So hyperventilation related to acute pulmonary edema, aspiration of foreign body, atelectasis. So when we talk about the causes in acute pulmonary edema, definitely there is fluids, or well, fluids are kept in the lungs because of the backflow from the lungs backflow from the congestion around the heart, the left side of the heart becomes congested. And therefore, once it's congested, fluids or blood is pushed through the pulmonary veins back into the lungs. And these sips, the serous fluid sips around the lungs. And once there are fluid around the lungs, it displaces the air. So in acute pulmonary edema, there is great hypoventilation. 
and the oxygen saturation becomes too low and therefore you build carbon dioxide. So that is why in acute pulmonary edema, there is respiratory acidosis because of buildup of carbon dioxide in circulation. Aspiration of foreign body. Once you aspirate, you allow substances to enter into the lungs other than air. And once it goes in there, it affects respiratory rate. So especially in children, when you feed them, don't just breastfeed these children and put them to sleep. After breastfeeding, you have to put them on your chest and bath or beat at the back to break the wind. Once you break the wind, the possibility of aspiration becomes very, very low. Otherwise, once you aspirate into the lungs, it affects respiration, can cause choking, and so on and so forth. Atelectasis. Atelectasis is collapse of the lungs. Once the lungs are collapsed, uh, the airbags are flattened, and exchange of gases becomes poor. Accumulation of carbon dioxide, it turns into respiratory acidotic. Pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is having air accumulated around the thoracic cavity. And once it does that, it changes the atmospheric pressure. You know, you are supposed to have certain pressure within the lungs that allows carbon dioxide to exchange and oxygen is absorbed. So once you have broken that barrier and you have allowed air to enter, it destroys the pressures within the thoracic cavity. And therefore, carbon dioxide cannot go out and oxygen absorbed. So the pneumothorax aff affects exchange of gases and this leads to accumulation of carbon dioxide, making the respiratory or leading the body into respiratory acidotic. Overdose of sedatives. The sedatives, when you take overdose, depresses or suppresses the respiratory center. And when the respiratory center is affected, different respiration is affected. And when respiration is affected, carbon dioxide accumulates and increases in concentration, turning the body into metal respiratory acidotic. In pneumonia, what happens is all these conditions, pneumonia, emphysema, they are come together to form what is called COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary edema. They are part of them. Asthma is part, pneumonia is part, emphysema is part, bronchiectasis, bronch and then bron bron bronchitis. They are all part of COPD cases. And once they are part, they cause hypoventilation because in pneumonia, the alveoli backs, the lungs are inflamed. And once they are inflamed, the ability for them to get oxygen and takes carbon dioxide out becomes low. And once it is low, this carbon dioxide accumulates. That is why even in pneumonia, oxygen sometimes is administered because the exchange of the lungs for gases becomes poor and compromised. So in pneumonia, there is accumulation of carbon dioxide, making the body respiratory acidotic. Emphysema. In emphysema, you have the alveoli backs taken over sometimes by abnormal bag of air occupying a greater space within the, uh, within the loop of the lungs. So the loops are occupied by abnormal air of bag, occupying greater space for the lungs. Meanwhile, this abnormal bag, which is so big, occupying a larger space, is not taking part of the exchange of gases. So it is a, it has destroyed so many smaller alveoli, destroying capillaries, and then the loops. And it's occupied there, causing poor conduction or poor exchange of gases. And this reduces the lung volume, leading to accumulation of carbon dioxide. Bronchiectasis. This is abnormal dilatation of the bronchial tree where you have uh, acidus accumulated and this compromises the exchange of gases, making always acidus available in the uh, respiratory tree, compromising exchange of gases in bronchiectasis. So bronchial asthma, we all know there is spasms and then there is closure of the airway leading to poor exchange of gases. Carbon dioxide cannot be exchanged out. Oxygen cannot be drawn inside. There's accumulation of carbon dioxide leading to respiratory acidotic. Okay, before the diagnosis, any questions so far before I move on? Any questions so far?
Yes. I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's the I, 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 let me hear you. Your hand is up. Let me hear you. Okay, sir, so with the, you talk about the bunker uh, asthma. Sure. In, in the bunker asthma, I was thinking it rather causes um, uh, this in respiration alkalosis. Why? Because in so doing, the person is able to breathe in but not out. <laughs> The person is able to breathe what in in. Uh huh. So oh, when so you because in, you see that the person is like they, they are they, they are, breathe in and out just say like they will be gasping. For they, mm -hmm. Like the 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 what is no enough. Yes, like the 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 in is more than the the out because you see them. So they breathe out. Have, is it breathe out or they breathe in? I've been having this uh, argument listen, since school. Listen, listen, hello, listen, 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 it's simple, okay? Do you hey, know the tri triad? Say, no, try you want <laughs> yes, <laughs> this, the question is funny. Do you know the triad of the pathophysiology of asthma? It is simple. The three, we have the bronchospasm, Mm -hmm. The broker constriction, mm -hmm. and we have the uh mucopyrulent. Okay, so so you see who is who is who is who is making noise? It is the it is the uh the biostatistics lecturer, he just came around. Okay, so the three always lead to asthmatic attack, okay. The, the mucopyrulent, you produce a lot of mucus. And once the mucosa lining produce a lot of mucus due to bronchoedema, what happens? There's closure of the airway, okay? And once you force air through the narrowed airway, that is where you hear the wheezing respiration, right? There's also muco, the bronchospasms. Once the bronchial airway set into spasms, they close up, okay? Very good. So there's broker constriction, there's mucopyrulent, and therefore there is a, 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 a difficulty in breathing out. And if you could see, asthmatic patients find it difficult. The wheezing comes when they are taking out air, when they are bringing air. <laughs> so anytime they want to bring out the carbon dioxide, then that is where air is forced out into the constricted airway. And that is where you hear the wheezing sound and the wheezing respiration. So they are struggling to bring out accumulated carbon dioxide. All right, so we move on. Thank you. Okay. okay so let's move on. We have a uh, diagnosis here. We have arterial blood gas measurement or evaluation. We have, because we are talking about respiratory acidosis. For most time. Yes, it's almost time because of your question. It's not yet. We are supposed to close at 145. So let me finish at 145. Because you've been asking questions in between. I need to hit at 145 and close up. So we have pH is less than 7.35. Partial pressure of carbon dioxide is greater than because of the acidosis, you should have carbon dioxide greater than 42 millimeters of mercury. And we are acidic medium, so we should be having less values of the pH. And we have decreased partial pressure of arterial oxygen and renal retention of bicarbonates. So uh, signs and symptoms, you have sudden hypercapnia. Hypercapnia is buildup of carbon dioxide in the blood. Increased pulse rate, because this state also may make something like, I told you, you have run a 100 meter race. So all the hemodynamics are high. There's increased pulse rate, in case of respiratory rate, you are panting, increased blood pressure. Every activity is high. Feeling of fullness in the head due to cerebrovascular dilatation. Weakness, sometimes you have become exhausted and you feel so weak, you want to lie down. Ventricular fibrillation. Uh, here you are experiencing ventricular fibrillation because of uh, uh, too much uh, acidosis. It's affecting electrical activity mm. of the heart and you are, you are experiencing fibrillations. So management here depends upon the cause. If it is bronchoconstriction, give bronchodilators. 
to reduce the bronchial spasm as well. Example to give uh, uh, a ventralin to or aminophilin to dilate the bronchial airway in case of asthmatic conditions. If it is pneumonia and it's affecting inflammations in the lungs, treat with strong antibiotics and clear the infections so the person can breathe better. Always the management is geared towards the cause. Frequent or proper coughing to get rid of mucus from the airway because of the mucopurulence blocking the airway. Adequate hydration to make sure that mucus are able to brought out at a fast to clear the airway. If you are not hydrated, mucus cannot come out. Mechanical ventilation to improve pulmonary ventilation. So here, mechanically, you are ventilating and once you do mechanical ventilation, you improve. That way you can find your own self. Decrease elevation of partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Decrease elevation of partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Slowly to prevent alkalosis and convulsion. So if you want to decrease carbon dioxide con concentration, you have to do it in a slow manner so that you don't cause convulsion when you suddenly drop or move the person from acidosis to alkalosis. The person can go into convulsions and then you add the routine nursing care, which is bathing, mouth care, and other things. Uh, next week, you will look at respiratory alkalosis and move on to the electrolytes. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? Yes, you've almost exhausted all your questions along the line. So uh, as you called for the time, we have almost come to the end of the lecture. Without any further questions or contributions, we bring the lecture to an end. Uh, 